All right. So here we are ready to have our conversation again. Hello, Deb. Hello. <laughs> so this week we're in chapter four of Nancy Wilson's Virtuous. Um, and this chapter is entitled Contentment. Contentment. What a fun topic, right? I think that there were a lot of surprises, um, at least for myself. I think Deb will have something similar, but I was really um, surprised by how much I was challenged um, with contentment uh, this week. I didn't really realize um, how many areas could use a bit of a attention for me. So I'm sure we've all been challenged as we've gone through the book. Um, but let's just jump right into it. So page 23, if you've got your book with you, and it'll be contentment. Um, as we get into that, it's going to start off with the word contentment, but Deb actually has the definitions written down. So you want to go for that? Yeah. So we're going to just start off with the root word. Um, I'm not quite sure how to pronounce it. I think it's archaeo. It means to be enough, uh, to be sufficient, a deep satisfaction for the will of God. And in Logos, it says a state of mind in which one's desires are confined to his lot, whatever it may be. Hmm. And um, 1 Timothy 6.6 6 says, but godliness actually is a means of great gain when accompanied by contentment. Uh, we also have it simplified. If you're always wanting more than what you have, you aren't content. It's okay to want things, but when you think, if I just had that, then I'd be happy. You're not content anymore. Be happy with what you have. That's contentment. So simplified, um, there's just a little idea of what it is. I love that. Well, I mean, Nancy opens up um, saying contentment is very useful to learn because and apply because with contentment, we can be comfortable in all kinds of situations. And um, I, you know what, the next thing, I love how Nancy always shows such honor and respect to her mother-in-law. It's got to make her husband feel so loved as well. But she always fondly speaks of her mother-in-law and the wisdom that she learned from her. And she said her mother-in-law defined Christian contentment as a deep satisfaction with the will of God. Um, continuing, if we know that God works all things for our good and his glory, then we can accept our circumstances with contentment. And I love that because I was thinking about um, one of the quotes we shared last week. I believe it was in cheerfulness. But whenever there is a lack of contentment or cheerfulness, it's typically uh, rooted in a in somewhat of a distrust uh, for God, for what he's working in, in our life story. Um, maybe we don't like how things are going. <laughs> We're not pleased uh, with the, the way that he's written our life or our story. We thought maybe it would go differently or we wanted it to go differently. And then that's where we find ourselves um, discontent and and really that that's rooted in thinking that we know better or we had a better plan. But if we can trust um, and and walk with confidence, knowing that God is in control, that God is good, and that He uh, has worked all things for His glory, for our good, His glory, then we can have peace and contentment with it, right? Right. You know, I just back up for one second. I. I look at the uh, being comfortable in every situation. And, you know, we've talked a lot about purposing mm -hmm. to do certain things, purposing to make him the focus of our day, purposing his word, purposing prayer. And um, for this, for every situation that comes our way, purposing to choose contentment, yeah. purposing any of these virtues. So, Definitely understanding what that definition of these virtue, of whatever virtue it is that you're looking at, and purposing to be comfortable in whatever situation. I've never really thought about it before yeah. like that. Um, so it is, and we're going to look here um, as we go further down, but but it's a change of mindset. Well, and you know what it is? It's not like a denial of reality. Like, I'm just not going to look at my circumstances, or I'm going to just shut my eyes and not see and that way i'm not bothered it's actually deeper it's actually far deeper far deeper yeah yeah and then um um what was it that you just said here a moment ago um oh my goodness well being comfortable Sorry. in every situation 
Um, but, you know, we did just discuss about, you were talking about difficult circumstances and they show us who we really are. Oh, no, I, I'm sorry, you guys. I'm, I would just, I'll just tell you all right now. I'm a, lot, a little bit off this week. I'm just tired. Just very, very tired. So I'm sorry if I come off a little spacey today, but you know, it's just life and that's just how we are sometimes. But um, as far as the choosing goes, uh, what you were bringing up about the choice and I, I just, I really was, um, I've been kind of amazed at every week that we have moved forward in our um, conversations through this book at the element of um, making a conscious decision or making a choice um, t to approach something. And so I, I keep going back to the discipline um, or the diligence, which was the first virtue that we actually talked about. And there is a diligence aspect with contentment that we can't ignore. There's a, and the, the discipline that we're trying to cultivate or that we're going to talk about cultivating in our lives at this point is when a circumstance that might lead to a discontent, um, whether it be, you know, complaining or griping or whining or just um, not being satisfied uh, with whatever it is. Instead, when recognizing that temptation um, to, to maybe sin in that way or to respond in that way, and at, at the moment that we recognize the temptation, the diligence to respond biblically and that, that's really what we're going to get into today, which I am so excited about, even though I forgot it a moment ago. <laughs> <laughs> but that is what I'm excited about. So as we move on to page 24, that's what is being discussed here. It's being content everywhere and in everything. Um, if we, we, we want to read Philippians 4, 11 through 13 real quick here. Oh, yeah. Well, she actually wrote it in the book here, too. Do you want me to read it? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to be abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Wait a second. So does this mean like I can be like, I can do anything? Yeah. I can like lift the house up, right? And have superpowers if I want that. No, no. <laughs> you know, I'm just saying that because so often you hear this scripture it's taken cool. out of context or just misused, misapplied. And really um, that the anything is talking about being content, having peace and satisfaction in Christ, regardless of what's going on. And in my book, I actually underlined that whole section and I wrote in big, bold letters, by Christ alone. It's all about Jesus. It's all about um, what he has done and what he He does do. <laughs> and it's not about my own strength or my own, you know, I'm just, I'm just so great with this great attitude all the time. <laughs> right. We, we have heard and seen this scripture misquoted multiple times. Yeah. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We brought up in our woman's study uh, last week in regards to this, that um, it is definitely in our culture misused and misused in the way of I can do all things like I'm some superhero. Yeah. And, or again, we hear the people at the gym. Yeah. I lift heavier weights. I can do all things. <laughs> I can lift heavier weights. <laughs> you know, the, the focus is not on us. Yeah. It's not supposed to be on us. It is all and 100% about him and what he puts before us, what he desires for us to do. And again, he's the one doing it. Well, by Christ, we can walk in obedience to him. We're no longer captive, bound to sin. Uh, and that's that's really what it's coming down to. And not that we are perfect or not that we have attained um, that glorious state, but we now, um, he has provided all that we need to walk in obedience and to walk for his glory, to live for his glory. Uh, yeah, it's not about running faster and jumping higher or right, whatever a self-glorifying thing we can think of. And uh, in in this on this page um, in the middle, it says contentment is a close cousin to cheerfulness. Um, you know, they you just as we continue moving through the book, we just see how they all intertwine with one another and build. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, you know, it's not like you can have one without another. Um, maybe two or three or four, 
or combined yeah. with whatever situation is before you. So, well, and what's cool too is um, the foundational aspect. I mean, I'm, I just marvel at the way that the Lord has guided some of these conversations. You know, we keep coming back to the need for repentance um, before trying to pursue something. We need to recognize that we're fleeing something. Um, you know, as we pursue virtue, we are we are fleeing the sin um, that we need to repent of, and um, and. Really, if we don't take those foundational things, this, 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 it all builds on those things. Everything, every virtue that we speak of builds off the last. Right. And it's a great progression. Right. She says, growing in one, you will grow in another. Mm-hmm. Um, so. Well, and that that's kind of the fruit, too, that we see so often with discipline. You know, once you... Um, gain some discipline in one one area of your life, it tends to overflow into other areas. Yeah. Um, and that can be for good or for bad. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Um, um, moving on to uh, the source of our contentment there on the bottom paragraph of page 24. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, um, there's a portion towards the end of that one where she says that all things that he's referring to is being content in all circumstances. That's kind of what we were just saying. But in other words, contentment is through the strength of Christ, and it is not at all through our own strength. Again, it's Jesus. It's not about us. It's not. It's less of me, more of Him. Amen. <laughs> um, on page twenty-five, um, I also um, I just I loved I love how she just closes this one out. But Jesus freely gives us Himself and enables us to do something that is is beyond our own strength. And um, I had written down a verse, Zechariah 4, 6, and I've got to flip in my Bible here because I put post-it notes in mine, uh, but not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of armies. That's Zechariah 4, 6. And again, just considering that all these things are far beyond, far beyond any of our own ability, um, but the cool thing, so I had Zechariah 4, 6, and that one pointed me to Ephesians 6, 17. I'm going to pull that up again here. And I'll go ahead and read that one for you. It says, oh, thank you. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And what I was pointing out there, or what was pointed out to me, I wish it was all of my own, but um, the the common word being the Spirit, Um not by my might or not by might nor by power, but by my spirit. And then in Ephesians, it's saying, well, what is the spirit, uh, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And so whenever we're faced with these different circumstances or different challenges, um, the different things that might, um, might tempt us um, to sin and discontent, how do we combat that? How do we respond to it? What is the biblical response? Well, in this case, the, the response is actually scripture. You know, to get into the word, to read the truth, to be refreshed um, in the truth of the word and um, and to refocus on on what is true. You know, whatever is true, whatever is good, whatever, whatever is beautiful. And these things point to the glory of the Lord, regardless of the circumstances. Right. And you had actually mentioned something regarding um, hard circumstances. There, there are grace that press us into Christ yeah. and into his word. And uh, we were looking, I think, at James 1. Yeah, yeah. Actually, James uh, 1, 2 through 4 is um, what I had written down before. And if you'd like, I'll go ahead and read that. It says, consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance and let endurance have its perfect uh, result so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Hmm. Yeah, I think um, so often when we find ourselves looking at the difficult things, the challenges or the frustrations or the sources of anxiety, whatever it might be, um, if instead we had the discipline to say, okay, this is a grace that causes me to lean into Jesus, to press into him, to seek the Lord for wisdom, for guidance. You know, when you're posed with, a question. Uh, I don't know what to do. And instead of stressing about what to do or how to do it, if instead we were to recognize, wait, this is causing me to ask the Lord. This is causing me to dig into the word. Right. Thank you, Lord, for this this thing that pressed me further into you. Um, what, if it's um, 
maybe sorrow or sadness. Maybe you're sad about something uh, and you go, you know, there's no comfort, there's no peace. But then as you, it call, call, causes you to cry out to the Lord, uh, maybe just, maybe not even with words at that point, that has, that grief or that difficult thing has now pressed you further into Jesus. And I love, I, you know, I'm a very visual person. Um, <laughs> I, I truly, and I can almost feel it, you know, when you put your weight into a loved one's arms, you know, when you put your, your actual, um, you, you just, you're actually leaning with your, your full body weight, um, uh, you know, resting. And I think about like holding a child, you know, sometimes I've got littles at home and, you know, they get hurt or different things happen. And, uh, and all they want to do is just throw themselves into my arms and lean into me and they just want me to hold them and that's what we have the opportunity to do when these challenges come into our path we can throw ourselves into the arms of Jesus um, in his word and put our weight into him and let him hold us and guide us and speak to us I foresee a shirt being made that says press into Jesus. <laughs> oh, that would be so good. Is that a new tagline? <laughs> I think it's a new one, y'all. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, the hard circumstances truly are a grace that do press us into Christ. Um, you know, sh- we're going to, do you want to read that passage in 2 Corinthians eleven twenty three through 27 as far as the things that Paul went through? Nancy on page 26 really gives us a, a nice bullet point list. Um, right. What do you want to do here? So we'll go ahead and read the passage because we want to make scripture a focus here. Um, it says, are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more in laborers, more abundant in stripes above measure in prisons, more frequently in deaths often. From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep, in journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Boy, if there's somebody that has just the example of contentment and understanding it and walking through it, it would be Paul. Oh my goodness. Well, and you know, without kind of, I don't want to skip over this one little part. Nancy pointed out that if the Apostle Paul had to learn this virtue, Mm -hmm. then it is not something that we can expect to do naturally on our own. I mean, come on. What an encouragement. Yeah. I mean, Paul learned these things. So we, you know, let's take the time to learn it too. You know, let's take the time to, let's not just assume that we're going to just be good at it right off the bat right, either. Right. This is all learning and growing. So, okay. He was whipped many times, in prison many times, nearly died several times. I shouldn't laugh. I mean, like, it's just like amazing though. Uh, five times the Jews whipped him with 39 lashes. He was beaten with rods on three occasions. He was stoned once. He was shipwrecked three times and spent a night and a day in the sea, which, by the way, that's like a horrible, like, nightmare thing in my mind. Things in the sea really freak me out. (laughs) He was often in danger. He was in danger from false brothers. He suffered weariness, painfulness, and sleeplessness. He was often hungry and thirsty and without food or drink. He was often cold and naked. Yeah, she says, I think this should be enough to qualify Paul to speak to us about contentment. I'd so, say so. <laughs> uh, I can't say anything to one of these. So <laughs> no, it makes us seem like uh, life's not so hard here for us, uh, looking at oh. all the trials and tribulations he went through. Well, and, and just remembering, like she said here, the only way he found contentment was through the strength of Christ, not his own ability. She referenced Acts 16.25, where he and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. Uh, And that's, you know, that's when they were in prison and, and God was glorified. In fact, he brought himself more glory. Years ago, I heard um, a great, uh, a missionary wife 
talking about opportunities for God to bring himself more glory. And um, when the circumstances were dire uh, and there was no way out, nothing could be changed, but then God would do something that we that was beyond anything anybody here could have done. And uh, And I think of that when I think of the fruit of them praying and singing hymns in prison to God. There is such a gift in in singing hymns and praises. And um, I love that they knew what to do when the circumstances were dire. Right. You know, instead of just sitting down and crying. And even, I mean, like, you know, they were praying, which is good, right? But they also, I think they they understood that they needed to do something um, a little bit more um, proactive right. to, to direct their hearts. You know, as far as, um, I mean, sometimes just sitting in silence and meditating might sound nice, but might not be the best thing to do if maybe you're struggling with depression right. <laughs> or loneliness. Maybe uh, maybe that's more the time to sing a hymn, sing a psalm, Absolutely. get loud. And, you know, we talked a little bit about it, you know, in those times. Um, boy, a thankful heart. Start yeah. the, just speaking out loud mm-hmm. uh, to God. I'm thankful for this. I'm thankful for that. These things can, I know for me, uh, when I go to that direction, because we all can go there, these things actually can help and humble you out and show you to be grateful. Yeah. And um, they actually encourage you as you talk it through, speak it out loud. Don't just speak it in your head or write it down. You know, I I love writing and journaling things, um, especially the, you know, just any kind of scripture that really points you back to the truth um, and gets my focus right. And, and really that that's, that's what Paul and Silas were doing. They were putting their focus um, everything that they had um, was um, focused on Christ, and out of that came contentment. And um, you know, moving on into in the in this uh, chapter here on twenty seven, page twenty seven, you know, she was really pointing out how the focus on uh, discontent, or I'm sorry, the focus when we're discontented, it's more on our trouble or our circumstances or ourself, um, and that's why. Paul and Silas, they weren't saying, oh, what was me in prison? I'm cold or I'm hungry, which really, I mean, those things were, were true. Right. <laughs> you know, it wasn't, it wasn't that the, those things wouldn't have been true. They, they are true, but they chose not to dwell on that, but rather to dwell on the glory of God and to how can we take this circumstance and bring him more glory? Uh, I love that. Right. Very, very proactive. You had, um, you had talked about, you had some stories written down uh, that really kind of pointed towards a, a right response or a biblical response to different things. Do you want to share those? Right. Um, so we had three different ones. And um, I think this particular one, uh, it starts off with a Puritan sat down to his meal and found that he had only a little bread and some water. His response was to exclaim, What? All of this and Jesus too. <laughs> Contentment is found when we have a correct perspective on life. So pray that you too may not lose the small influence you now have for Christ by coveting something larger for which you are not equipped and which God constantly refuses you in his love. Learn to be content. You know, there's things that we can reach for yeah. that he doesn't mean for us. And it, it could be good. It could be a ministry. Yeah, but if if God hasn't uh, put those things before you and said yes and amen, um, yeah, and you're kind of reaching, um, you know, we just we we talked about walking in the calling that is set before us mm. and doing it moment by moment throughout the day and just being faithful in that next step with a biblical response, a right response. You know, um, I know we come back to this every week. Um, it's this, it's one of it's become kind of a tagline for us, you know, just be faithful today and then do it again tomorrow. You know, one step at a time, um, all of those things. Um, but um, truly, it is that simple. Now, just because it's simple doesn't mean that it's easy, but it absolutely, it, it you know, simplifying those things is is really. Um, a proactive way for us to actually pursue that contentment as well and to get our, our mindset right. Mm-hmm. Um, because, you know, we're going to get into a couple of things here as far as um, the sources of di- discontent and all of that. And um, 
and you know where that comes from but so often it comes out of um trying to do too much or putting too many things all on our plate and and not actually stopping and saying lord what have you called me to do lord what is my primary ministry here am i neglecting my primary ministry so that i can do these other things um and so really simplifying that focus and kind of honing in on that. Right, right. So we're going to look at uh, two sources of discontent. Um, so the signs, it says there in the middle of page 26. Oh, yeah. The signs of discontent are grumbling, envy, anger, and complaining, just to name a few. Ah. Discontent is a restless desire for something else or something more. And we've got two stories here that can help paint a picture for you guys. Um, so I'm going to read the first one. It says, two little teardrops were floating down the river of life. One teardrop asked the other, who are you? I am a teardrop from a girl who loved a man and lost him. But who are you? The first teardrop replied, I am a teardrop from the girl who got him. Hmm. Life is like that. We cry over the things we can't have, but we might cry twice as hard if we had received them. Paul had the right idea when he said, I have learned the secret of being content in every, any and every situation in Philippians 4.12. Hmm. So um, we've got one more little story here. Real oh, quick, though, I just feel like that's so relatable. How many times I have gone back and thanked God for his nose yeah, for the absolutely. things that he said no to. Yes. Oh, thank you, Lord. Oh, like, I'm so glad I didn't marry that awful boyfriend or <laughs> you know, all those things. Thank you, Lord, for saying no. Right. Um, so the next one is um, a little funny. It says, a little Swiss watch had been made with the smallest of parts and great skill. Yet, it was dissatisfied with its restricted sphere of influence on a lady's wrist. It envied the position of the great tower clock on the city hall. One day, as it passed with its owner by the city hall, the tiny watch exclaimed, I wish I could go way up there. I could then serve many instead of just one. Now, it so happened that its owner was in a position with the city that gave her access to the tower clock. So she said, you shall have your opportunity, little watch. The next day, a slender thread was let down from the tower and the little watch was tied to it. Slowly and carefully, the watch was pulled up the side of the tower rising higher and higher each moment. Of course, when it reached the top, it was completely lost to view. In this dramatic way, the watch learned that its elevation had affected its annihilation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it's really if meant to be a little watch on someone's wrist. Yes then that's the calling has set, that, that God has set before you. So again, we're talking about the being content and yes. calling of what the Lord has put in your life, the people in your life, the situations in your life day to day, and, right. and, and finding joy in that, finding peace yeah. in that, finding strength in that, wisdom in that, and not desiring to go beyond what he has called you to. Well, and you know, it's one of my favorite conversations, but considering the ordinary Christian life, just a life of ordinary faithfulness unto the Lord to daily wake up and say, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. How could I bring you glory today, Lord? Thank you for another opportunity to serve you. And then just do it, you know, do those things that he has called you to do um, joyfully. And that's why I, I love even talking about like, oh, how we can glorify the Lord with our attitude, with the right attitude, the right heart while doing the dishes or while, you know, vacuuming or cleaning the car or while doing data entry, you know, <laughs> whatever the Lord has you doing right now. Maybe you're an accountant and um, and you're just doing that math for his glory, then praise the Lord. And I think that so often we can kind of be um, caught in the trap of looking for bigger, better things. You know, I want to be like the next 
Billy Graham or Anne Graham Lotz or Elizabeth Elliot or, you know, whoever it might be. And you look at these big grandiose things and and kind of like turn your nose up at the ordinary things. And ordinary doesn't mean mundane or mediocre. It just means um, not looking for that kind of glory, you know, not looking for something. And not that those not that those people weren't used for the glory of God. But if, I think, uh, in fact, I, I've heard different interviews with Elizabeth Elliot that she wasn't looking to make some big, huge thing. I mean, she was just trying to be faithful, to be a good wife, um, and to do what the Lord had called her to do. She worked hard, and the Lord the Lord is the one that did the bigger things through that. Um, right. Another way of looking at this um, that they're, they're basically talking about, because we're going to see this uh, scripture in Hebrews 13, 5. Yeah is those things that he has called us to be content in and walking in, they're not always easy. No. And he says that in Hebrews 13, 5, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Um, And so walking in the things that are set before us, there's going to be trials, there's going to be troubles. But if our focus again is on him in the midst of the turmoil and in him in the midst of the trouble, um, we know we can be a hundred percent sure that he'll carry us through. Well, and then um, there is something to be said for learning to love uh, the work of faithfulness. You know, learning to love the diligence um, uh, of just walking steadfastly in the things he's called us to do, and um, not not looking to do other things. I always, I know, uh, we're going to get into talking about duties in a little bit. And I always think of Nacho Libre where he's like, I need to find some better duties. <laughs> um, but we don't need to find the better duties. Let's delight in being faithful in the duties that he's called us to here and now. Um, Nancy points out um, further on uh, down that page, whatever our circumstances or possessions, God has given us something very precious Jesus has promised that he will never leave or forsake his people. Is that not enough um, to rejoice over? Is that a not an, is that not enough um, to lead us into contentment? And she actually says that is by far the best reason for contentment. No matter how difficult it might be, our Savior is with us and will strengthen us. Right. Yeah. And then we look at number two on page 28. It says things we don't have. Mm. And it says, Jesus said, take heed and be aware, beware of covetousness for one's life does not consist in the abundance of things he possesses. Luke 12, 15. You know, it's, it's kind of funny because um, before we were recording today, we were talking about fun things like going out shopping and, you know, things we've seen lately that we thought were cool and stuff like that. Um, And it's so easy uh, I'm I'm very grateful that we we're able to talk about those things, and I don't I don't think there was any sense of like oh I can't be happy till I have those things <laughs> like thankfully, yeah. um, but I think there have been seasons um, that we've probably gone through that um, of thinking oh man if I could just have that or just be this then it would just be great then I, then I would have all I need in life to be oh, happy. Go do this and yeah. go to this exciting place. If I could just lose this many pounds <laughs> and like have this wardrobe and, you know, these many things. You know, you think about that kind of stuff and, and it's like, well, <laughs> um, that is a that is so much in our culture, isn't it? Right. Um, I You know, I grew up in a pretty, I, you know, I grew up in Southern California. Fashion was all around me. And, um, and you know, I, I grew up, you know, I, I wasn't, uh, we weren't exactly well off, um, per se, but we grew up around a lot of people that were, and I did struggle with that for a long time going, man, I need to have that new, you know, whatever, whatever, those new shoes or that new purse. And, um, if I could just get my hairstyle to be like, to fit in with the crowd or whatever it is. And, uh, what a waste, uh, to spend so much time concerning ourselves with those things. And, and then now, um, I look at this, I look at this truth that we see here, um, what, what joy there is in just resting in Christ and delighting in him and seeking to bring him glory. Um, Nancy had written down Luke twelve fifteen, where Jesus said, take heed and beware of covetousness for one's life does not consist in the abundance of thing of the things he possesses. And we sometimes think if we could just add the things that are missing in our life, then we would be content. And sadly, that's just not true. 
Yeah, she says, uh, the sad truth is that no matter how much stuff we get, we can always think of something else we want. (laughs) Well, and you know, her example too, the discontented, uh, you know, if you're discontent when you're single and like just unhappy and miserable because because of your circumstances, whether it be singleness or whether it be, I don't know, maybe it's about um, your housing situation or just your life circumstances. You're just discontent. When those things change, if that's who you are, you're still that person. (laughs) You're still going to bring that with you everywhere you go. Right. Yeah. Even into a new marriage. So, oh gosh. Yeah. So we're down at the bottom, a few steps to take to learn contentment. And number one is express appreciation to God for your blessings and his promises. Choose to be thankful whether you feel like it or not. Tell God you want to be satisfied with all he is doing in your life. And that's that's what I was talking about um, in the beginning when we first started was, you know, all of us, I mean, if we're honest, all of us have times of depression. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. Times of discouragement, um, whatever it may be. If you just start praising the Lord and thanking him for yeah. all that he's done for you, for all the blessings. I mean, let's start with number one, salvation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, if we want to get the pull back and get the big picture, um, yeah. we get to live eternally with Jesus Christ one day. Yeah. <laughs> that in and of itself should be, um, thank you, Lord. Help me to... Uh, just redirect my focus. Amen. And um, I mean, that's a big one there, but a thankful heart usually does turn around any negative disposition that you might have or any sin that might be going on in your heart. And, you know, we've talked a lot um, in our study about setting a tone for your home, setting a tone for the day. And I truly do. uh, You know, I said uh, earlier, I shared that scripture about this is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Um, Wake up and say that out loud. Sing the song, (laughs) you know, sing the old Sunday school song. Um, But what a great way to start the day. Just in in thanking the Lord um, for another day, another another breath that we can bring him glory. And then ask him how you can bring him glory. Ask him, ask him, Lord, what would you have me do today? Right. Um, Number two, she says, confess any covetousness. So if you have an issue of discontent, um, then it's time to confess it. Uh, Call it what it is. Call it by the ugly sin that it is. Um, Covetousness is ugly and it should feel ugly and look ugly and smell ugly because it is ugly. (laughs) So confess it like the ugly sin it is and then repent. Um, What is it to repent? We talked about like what biblical repentance actually looks like. So not only are we naming that sin and now we're we're saying, you know, we're confessing that before the Lord, but then now we're going to turn from it and we're going to run the opposite direction. We're going to pursue the virtue of contentment. So go back to step one and start singing his praises. Go back to that that first one. After you've confessed your conf- um, your covetousness or whatever discontent that might be uh, and repented, ask for forgiveness and then now be proactive and praise him. Thank him glorify him right and uh, moving down to three it says remember that all things truly do work together for good to those who love god and are called according to his purpose romans 8 28 god ordains all things that come to pass god is sovereign i think we must yeah. have on to that we must truly believe that and can we trust that yes i i think that that's that's actually probably the bigger challenge at least for myself can I trust that? Because maybe I'm a little bit of a control freak. Mm-hmm. <laughs> maybe sometimes I think I know better. But can I just trust and rest that God is good? God is in control. Right. It says he is a wise and loving father. He will use all these things for our good. So interpret the situation in a way that sees God as doing that right now. You know, um, a lot of times we'll hear people ask a question like, how could a kind or loving God do this or that? How could, and they, they'll, they'll pose a question where God is in the negative um, position on that one. 
And we need to reframe those questions um, and understand that if there is any doubt, if there is any confusion on this, um, then you're wrong. <laughs> Let's not assume uh, that scripture or that God is the one with the flaws here. Um, and so whether it come down to your lack of understanding or your lack of trust or or just your lack of uh, of knowledge of, of biblical truth, um, but we're the problem, not God. That's right. <laughs> Number four, um, ask yourself, what are my duties in this situation? Does God want you to mope and feel sorry for yourself? Your mindset should be on how to glorify him and turn a profit on this difficulty. Um, what can I learn from this? Or, you know, how can I be a good steward? How can I please God? I love this. I love the questions that she, uh, she suggests here, because truly to turn a profit on a bad thing, we're not just talking about how to make lemonade from lemons. But truly, how can we glorify and honor our king? How can we we point others to the, the glory of God in our difficult circumstances and delight in the opportunity to do that? That's why before, you know, I talked about the hard things, um, the, the challenges that we face, that those are a grace that cause us to press into him. And I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, but but truly, how could we view this as a grace opportunity for God's glory and truly delight in that opportunity to partake in that? So I think the theme here is the word opportunity. Hmm. Um, do we have the mindset? Do we think about these different things as opportunities? Yeah. So um, I think that's a, a good shift for our mindset to start looking at What's the opportunity in this situation that I might be discontent? Well, um, you know, this weekend, um, Luke and I were away traveling and and somebody asked a question, are you an optimist or a pessimist? And I was, I actually missed the beginning of that conversation, but I heard the recap on it later. And, uh, and it's funny because we can think, are you a, a glass half full or a glass half empty kind of a person? Um, but, but really it actually goes a lot further than that. Um, you know, we're not, it's not being suggested that you deny reality, you know, that you deny the truth, but rather to look the truth in the eye and say, okay, this is tough. This is, this is, um, this is a, a, a glass that only has half a, half a cup of milk in it. What could I do uh, to use this for God's glory? Yeah. She says, this helps us see the difficulty, not as something God is doing to us, but rather as what he is doing for us. Right. So don't pull the wool over your eyes. We're not saying close your eyes and just pretend the problem isn't there. You should be able to face the problem, look at the problem, see it for what it is, and then say, okay, now God, how do I honor you in this? Now I might mess this all up, but um, we I did write this down and someone had brought this up that we are a tool on his tool belt. Oh, yes. Yeah, this is, uh, <laughs> I grew up, my dad's kind of a handy guy, uh, lots of tools around. And uh, my husband's a, a very tactical, actually, both our husbands are very tactical men. Um, and so they have yeah. these, <laughs> yes, thank God, <laughs> especially with a clumsy woman like myself. Uh, I need a handyman around, but um you know, they're always carrying these different tools. And so this kind of a response, this ability um, to, to actually pursue and to uh, exemplify contentment for God's glory, it's actually fantastic. It's something that applies to every situation, everywhere you go, um, if we're able to take it and, and kind of flip the challenge to God's glory opportunity it's fantastic and it really applies. I think that's what I was, I think that's what we were talking about. Mm -hmm. um, we had our original study on this chapter on like what, <laughs> nearly a week ago. So it's a little rough um, sometimes when there's this delay, but yeah. 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 We've got, we've got prudence on the brain since that's, <laughs> that's coming up this, this Friday. And uh, so, but again, you know, um, they had said that they, uh, they grow together and one onto another and forget where it was but it was um talking about uh being a let's see i don't want to mess this up all virtues grow on the same tree oh yeah so yeah i think nancy said that and that was so cool um did you want to do point five i thought that was a, such a good one too it says what is the opposite of contentment murmuring and complaining <laughs> pay attention to your thoughts and words that's the action 
So yeah. they're going to lay out this situation. And then our response, a right response, would be to pay attention to our thoughts first and our words. And um, do you sound content? But I have to, I have to say, uh, you know, confession, even the looks on my face, face to my husband, yeah. they don't look content. Um, had a situation in, um, this week and, you know, um, I was feeling a particular way and uh, my, my face definitely showed, showed how I was feeling. Yeah. Um, but I, you know, that's a hard one. I think a lot of us, um, show things on our face that are really in the heart and or even like an I mean it can be a respect thing or a disrespect thing I mean sometimes it's an eye roll but you know I think um I think it would be so helpful for all of us my, I'm talking to myself as well if we could just accept the fact that we're not as subtle as we think we are we're not <laughs> we're not <laughs> it um, is we are human and yeah th those things do happen um but then we go back to what do we do with what we mess up with and where we fell <laughs> oh, repent go back to the very beginning go back to the first thing right? i've i've been so convicted with this one because i know i know deb you're saying you're saying about that you know your your face ex facial expressions oh, okay. i am a whiner <laughs> i'm a total whiner like i mean and i i've realized this about myself um and i actually kind of have laughed about it over years like if i get sick um i'm a just i'm a total whiner you know if i if i have if i've hurt myself and i hurt myself often i totally whine about it i actually have a, pa a high pain tolerance but that doesn't hold me back from complaining about it and as we go through this book and this chapter, I'm just so convicted. And I find myself really uh, asking the Lord to help me with my words, with my language, and even just to sometimes close my mouth. Because um, <laughs> you know what she says, by being content, we sweeten even the worst of situations. Yeah. Wow, that is really neat to think about it in yeah. that mindset. Um, so in many cases, the discontent is worse than the circumstance. It is. That's true. By being content, we sweeten even the worst of situations. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's so good to, to, that's one to hold on to and think about. Yeah. So how can I sweeten this very bad, bad situation? Oh, no. What how can I glorify God in this? Like, how can I put situation? some honey on this? Yeah. Right. Or, like put some some glitter on it no maybe maybe she wants to maybe it's dazzle everything i know i'm like i need some crisp some swabsky crystals we're gonna bedazzle everything no so, uh, are you uh i was thinking about the uh, point six so we're on yeah. page 30 um of our book here and um uh, point number six is to be humble rather than thinking you deserve better be grateful for what you have learn to put others first and, oh, goodness, I mean, all of this is just convicting because so often we think, well, I've got standards. I should be, <laughs> I should be in this, you know, way or whatever. And it's like, no, humble yourself. Um, stop thinking so highly of ourself. In fact, again, just less of me, more of Jesus. That's really what it comes down to. Yeah, I don't think that we want what we really deserve. So, oh, thank God, I'm we don't. Really thankful for that. What yeah. we have and grateful and praise, praise Him for all those things. And, um, but the putting others first, you know, uh, yeah. when you when you do that, um, there is a humility that comes alongside that and a vulnerability. Um, and a thankfulness and gratefulness. And so um, if if you are putting somebody first and you are doing it begrudgingly. Ooh, that's not good. Yeah. Resenting that, it. Resent being yeah. better and yeah. Um, Grumbling maybe while you're stop. doing it. Yeah. Just stop it. Just don't, just stop. And, and repent. You repent. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, okay, wait, no, stop and then call it what it is. Right. Right. Yeah. Deal with it immediately. That's the, oh, keeping short account. <laughs> oh, hey, I think we have a video for that, right? Right. We've got one that's <laughs> really good. So number seven is keep a clear conscience before God. Sin always muddies the water so you can't see clearly. Hmm. Yeah. Again, repent, right? I mean, how do we, how do we have a clear conscience before God? We confess Call, name that ugly sin by its its biblical name. You know, is it um, covetousness? Is it anger or wrath? Is it 
um, greed and uh, what, you know, whatever it might be, call it what it is and repent. Um, ask the Lord to forgive your, your sinful heart and, and then start walking at the opposite direction. Right. It says, it, it, you know, as we do this, uh, it helps us to keep a clear conscience before God, but it brings so much peace. It brings joy. It brings, brings all the fruits of the spirit. Um, when we walk in this manner. Yeah. So we're near the end here to the sum it up on page 30. I mean, you yeah. Read that? Yeah. Um, so to sum it all up, let's see. Point number one, contentment is sweet. It makes all situations better while discontent makes them worse. Amen. <laughs> yeah. Number two, contentment keeps us from many other sins like covetousness, envy, anger, murmuring, or an ungodly competition with others. You know, um, that's something too um, to consider the uh, the uh, ungodly competition with others. Um, so often um, we might look at these things as like winning and losing. Uh, uh, like I won, you lost, or you know whatever. Um, keeping points, keeping score, and uh, that's just um, it's venomous. You know, it's it's really like a poison. Um, point number three, our possessions will never satisfy our souls. Only Christ can satisfy us and bring us the deep satisfaction we all hunger for. Have you ever gotten that one item that you're like, I must have this and I can't do anything but think about having this and how much joy it will bring me when I have this. And then you finally get this particular item and maybe not even a month or a week later, you see that item sitting in the corner that you used once and you thought, I'm not going to use this ever again. <laughs> you know, yeah, like I didn't really gadgets. see this. It didn't um, bring the satisfaction and joy that I thought it was going to yeah. bring. And <laughs> it turns out it wasn't as great as I thought. Yeah. Right. right. Um, and so we've got number four. Contentment gives us victory over ourselves. Remember, Christians are to take up their cross and die to themselves. Mm. Yeah, we we've, we've got a a lot. Um, we have a lot of issues as humans. <laughs> <laughs> we've got issues. <laughs> so uh, to have victory over yourself, and I thinking of self focus, self reliance. I was just thinking the bondage of sin that we've been freed from. Yeah, that bondage. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so contentment gives us victory over all of those things. Number five, when we choose to be cheerful and thankful, our spirits are quieted and we can rest in God. I, what more is there to say? Like, yeah. yes and amen. <laughs> um, I actually had written down at the very end, I said, now to do it, just do it. And then I wrote down Luke um, 6, 46 through 49. I'll read that real quick. Now, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and acts on them, I will show you whom he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid a foundation on the rock. And when there was a flood, the river burst against that house, and yet it could not shake it because it had been built well. It had been well built. But the one who has heard and has not acted accordingly is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation and the river burst against it, and it immediately collapsed. And the ruin of that house was great. So that's that's it. Now we have to do the things, right? Now we have to actually act on what we have, what we've learned here today. And if we don't want to be like the fool whose house is washed away, then we need to act on it. Because again, it's not just about knowing about a foundation or you know, learning all about a great foundation. It's about building a foundation and acting on it. Um, and, um, and that's where it comes down to. So I think now, um, at the end of our chapter, we came to a portion that was like an assignment. Um, we we're supposed to make a list of our discontents during our study, our discontents, one column for the things that we are discontent about that we have. And then a second one for the things we don't have. And of course I was like, I'm not sharing my list. Which <laughs> <laughs> like, it is private personal. So yeah. We just say, take these things to the Lord, do it. Take these things to the Lord. And if you want more re resources, um, at the end, she does say there are two um, great books 
um, their Puritan books, The Rare Jewel of Christian Contentment by Jeremiah Burroughs and The Art of Divine Contentment by Thomas Watson. Um, you know, I went ahead and looked on audible.com and oh, yeah. on there. So nice. I did start listening to one of them. And um, I think the whole book is like four hours and something minutes, which is very doable over a week. Yeah. Um, it's very, very good, I'll say so far. And there's a lot of other things to think about alongside contentment and what that is. Yeah, but it's not. And so um, if this is something that maybe you battle with, yeah, maybe check out these two books or that you're more interested or want to have more encouragement or go a little bit deeper in, um, um, grab them at audible.com and then you can just turn them on. Yeah. Listen, yeah. Maybe when you're driving in the car for a long trip or doing the dishes or laundry or can't get to sleep at night, mm -hmm. um, that it's it would be very helpful to those that want to dig a little well and these are these are just such jewels i know one of the ladies from our our study group on friday shared that um, chapter five of the rare jewel of christian contentment really really blessed her um these older books are just they're treasures they're a treasure trove um i thought it would be fun though to close out deb and i often when we're preparing for these things and going through our study we find uh, that we'll be looking at the same scriptures again and again and it's just the Lord um, blessing that, but um, we had both come to um, First Thessalonians five sixteen through eighteen. Be joyful always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And so you might be inclined to say something like, "Oh, there's nothing for me to be joyful about," or "You don't know the circumstances in my situation. You don't know about the bills I have to pay or that diagnosis that." Um, you know, I received or, you know, my marriage woes or my job woes or my children woes, um, whatever those might be. Have you not been granted faith? Do you not belong to Christ? Has his righteousness not been credited to your debt of sin? Has his Holy Spirit not been given to you to dwell in you? Is the presence and power of God not with you then? Has the Lord not been merciful to make you alive in Christ while you were still dead in your sins? Has the Father not promised to never leave you nor forsake you? Has it not been written that nothing can separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord? Has God not raised his Son from the dead to be seated in the heavenly realms, the Son who this very day, this very moment, lives to intercede before the Father on your behalf? Has he not promised to be preparing a place for you that where he is, you might be also? Have you no assurance that you'll be spared from the coming wrath of God by salvation through our Lord? Are any of those things not true? So praise the Lord. We have much to, pra to praise him for. We have much to be content in and to rest in. And to God be the glory um, in all of the circumstances that challenge us. Let's press into him. Let's consider those things that press us, that that don't crush us, that don't leave us completely broken. Um, let's consider those things to be a glory, a blessing, um, and, and praiseworthy. So, amen. I think that wraps it up for today. And for our subject matter of contentment, and this next week, we'll be going into prudence. So we look forward to you joining us as we seek to be more deeply rooted, growing in uh, faithfulness, fruitfulness, and fearlessness as we pursue the Lord. Have a great day, guys. God bless you. Bye-bye.